you're still watching ways um as you already know um we'll just go right into the conversation around the labor crisis a uh, labor party crisis that is going on and how we can rise above the challenges of course we've seen so many things happening and um uh, how do i even explain it <laughs> there's a fraction there's another fraction there's so many things happening so um we want to ask ourselves first of all what the problem is would there be an inauguration and um, if there would be any inauguration what would it look like given that there is a pending case in court um so i think that's about it um according to a news source the labor party chairman lamedia papa and the director general of peter obi's presidential campaign council akin Oshun Tokun clashed at the appeal court on Wednesday and the Labour Party has been immersed in leadership tussle with a papa getting um, a court ruling last week as acting chairman pending the determination of the party's leadership lawsuit by a federal high court. Now immediately after the ruling, a papa directed the party lawyers at the um, election tribunal to report to him. Now, our papa issued this directive on Friday while he also said that he is now in charge of Labour Party because the court affirmed his position as the acting chairman on the same day. Now, with inauguration just a few days away, we are asking the impact it will have on the tribunal, you know, and um, of course on the inauguration as well. Now, please let's hear what you have to say. Remember, you can join the conversation. Send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 081 8038 You can also tweet at us at Wayshow Africa on the hashtag Wayshow. So, um, Noma and Dela, I'm going to bring in David in a minute. I just want to hear your thoughts because, me, eh, in all fairness, I've been seeing the drama. I just got, I think I, I'm like one of those many Nigerians that are really tired. Uh, because first of all, I really don't trust the, the what's it called the judicial system in this country. I don't even know what is going on, so um, I'm a bit wary to even follow up on what is happening. All of a sudden, there's a fraction, there's this, there's that. I just feel like it's just too many things going on. So I just, you know, just to keep my sanity, I just, you know, took myself out of that. You know, I'm not, I'm not monitoring the tribunal, but <laughs> let me hear your thoughts. Are you guys monitoring? What are your thoughts on it? No, are you there? Okay, so it's going first. Oh, okay, I thought, I thought I was talking to myself. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> okay, so we're, we're with also, you all the way. I'm also not monitoring it because, I mean, like you said, it's tiring. I mean, it's just some drama. Every day comes with a new drama. But, um, I mean, you mentioned something about um, will um, an inauguration happen, you know, with all the tribunal issues and all that going on. I remember that. Um, in one of the episodes, um, as part of what um, Enough is Enough is doing, you know, um, we had spoken about, um, you know, the court ruling within 180 days. So, um, I mean, with all of this, it just goes to, I mean, it goes to show that there is still a, a, a time gap of 180 days. And within 180 days, a lot of things can happen. Does this mean that... Um, I mean, until the tribe, the the courts give the verdict, I'm not sure that anyone can stop the inauguration from happening. Um, especially because um, I'm not sure that there's a provision for a lacuna, you know, in the government. There is not constitutional to have an interim government, you know. So either way, they will probably still swear the inauguration will probably still happen, except you know something happens between now and Friday, you know, before the inauguration and. Um, Again, this is Nigeria where anybody, anything happens, you just wake up and you hear one news or the other. <laughs> you wake up at 3 a.m. and they've announced the election results. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so this is Nigeria. Absolutely. So I'm, not really, I'm not really, today, I mean, I just saw the news and I was just like, okay, we're at it again. Okay, whatever, <laughs> you know. So. Okay, let me hear your thoughts on normal, then I'll bring in David. Hmm. Nigeria, Nigeria, my country, Nigeria. It's been drama after drama after drama. And um, for me, I think I'll talk, I will speak from the perspective of the Nigerian citizens who are already tired. There is a crisis of confidence. There, it's Even where we saw some level of hope, it's seeming like chaos has even come into that situation as well. So it's like... 
You're moving from, the, it's like we're between the devil and the deep blue sea. And you can't help but wonder if truly there is a way forward for us as a country if we cannot put aside our selfish interests with, as opposed to looking at the greater good of the Nigerian citizens. So it, the, all of this has been... I mean, it's 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 making Nigerians to really lose confidence in the in in the country being able to move forward, and um, it, there's a huge cause for concern for the future, because if this rancor continues, then it seems like even the inauguration might be uh, under some form of uh, threat. Absolutely. And um, it, it's also putting us in a very bad position mm. as a nation towards the world. At the end of the day, anything can happen when there's a certain level of uncertainty that continues to proceed over the affairs of our country. Mm. And it's something that we need to tackle as quickly as possible Absolutely. before... We, we, we find ourselves in even worse state. Okay, so let me bring in David. David is a friend of the house, right? And he's an investigative journalist um, and the 2023 Distinguished James Curry Fellow at the University of Cambridge Center of um, African Studies. He's a broadcaster whose work has appear, uh, appeared on CNN, The Africa Report, AI Al Jazeera, and, um, sorry, Al Jazeera, <laughs> and The Watch Washington Post. Um, his work as a satirist on the other news um, Nigeria's answer to Daily Show has featured in the New Yorker magazine and in Netflix documentary Larry Charles' Dangerous World of Comedy. Now, he's joined us via Zoom. Thank you so much, David, for joining us this evening. Thank you for having me. All right, David, you see this matter, eh? As I am like this, I am tired, I am drained, and I believe that I am like many, amongst many Nigerians. You know, when the issues around the elections came up and they say go to court, I think a lot of us just lost hope. And it seems like with all the drama happening, it's just playing out what exactly our affairs were as, you know, um, when it was announced at the, at, at the first instant that, okay, they will take all the matters to court. Now, two things are playing out in my head. There's an inauguration coming up on the 29th of May, right? And there's one kind of on any crisis that just erupted from nowhere in the Labour Party. You know, how would this pan out? How would it affect anything, if at all, if there's going to be any, um, if there's going to be any, like, maybe impact? What would it look like? The Labour crisis, the Labour Party crisis is happening, you know, and, you know, um, juxtapose that with the inauguration that is happening. Or put it along, along that. What, what's, good, what's the update? <laughs> So, first of all, um, I think I need to um, clear up the impression that there is a quote-unquote crisis going on in the Labour Party. There is no crisis going on in the Labour Party. What is happening is an externally instigated attempt to distract the people who are pushing the, uh, the, the petition cases at the various tribunals, because it's not just the presidential election tribunal, they're also governorship tribunal such as the one in Lagos. Mm. So it's an externally instigated attempt to distract the attention of the principal officers of the party, especially the presidential candidates and the party chairman from carrying out their functions. Um, and with the with the verdict from, from the High Court, uh, I think it was, today is what? Today is uh, Monday. Wednesday, is it? Monday. Uh, Monday, sorry. Monday. Um, with, with the verdict last week, I think that should have been cleared up. So um, that's as far as that goes. The the entire idea that there was a crisis was a completely contrived external idea, and it's important that um, people understand that if one, if um, the Nigerian youth, as we like to call them, were trying to take on a deeply entrenched system which has existed for decades and which has never really been challenged to this extent before. There was always going to be something like this. The system was never really just going to sit down and fold its hands and watch you basically take this sort of unheard of no name party from total no hoper, total rank outsider to front runner in the space of nine months and not try to do something mm. to derail it. That's that this was always going to happen. So, you know, for the fact that the Labour Party has actually withstood the, these attempts for the most part 
to try and you know scatter these things. I mean, I, I guess that that tells a story on on its own. Yes, there have there have been there have been uh, the the so called um, the I think it was the, the High Court in Kano that supposedly issued some kangaroo judgment, supposedly um, sacking all Labour Party candidates in the elections. You know, and what people need to understand is that when you are dealing with the Nigerian judicial system, people can shop for verdicts, people can shop for orders. From any part of the, the state, country. yes, around yeah. this country. People do that. So it doesn't mean that it's valid. It doesn't mean that it's going to stand. The, the simple thing that's going to happen is somebody simply going to appeal and say, you don't have jurisdiction. And that's what's going to happen. Hmm. So, but people, people shop for friendly judges and friendly jurisdictions across Nigeria all the time to get all sorts of kangaroo judgments. It's a hmm. thing. So people don't need to sort of take that to the head. It doesn't really mean anything. Now, regarding the the, um, the 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 petition itself or the extant cases, because it's not just the, the petitions, there are several cases that I know of, at least five other individual cases which are uh, in front of the High Courts, the Appeal Courts and Supreme Courts. Um, what I believe is, I, I, I one of the, el the earlier panelists um, said something about it being um, unconstitutional for there to be an interim government. Yes, but mm -hmm. Um, the constitution also makes uh, a provision for what should happen in a case like this, assuming a supposed president elect is actually um, not sworn in, sworn in. The constitution makes it clear that the, the person who is next in line to be sworn in is the Senate president. So there is a constitutional allowance for that. So yeah, you then obviously the, um, either fresh elections would need to be held or uh, the, the tribunal or the Supreme Court would have to declare a winner, and then that person would then assume office. But for the time being, the Senate president would be sworn in as head of state if such a situation were to happen. So it's not as if there's a complete constitutional vacuum there. There's there's some provision that has been made. So um, and I think it's important to make these points because some um, some people from the ruling party are trying to sell the narrative that um, somehow if Bola Ametinbo is not sworn in next week, then Nigeria is going to descend into chaos. That's complete nonsense. That's not true. Nigeria has existed long before Bola Tinubu was alive and to be around long after he has gone. Hmm. Okay, you know what? Let's just go out on a very short break. When we come back from the break, I would like to discuss this now because I saw a post. I don't know who now, who gave about it. I think it's either the army or something. He said, if you don't have any business, it's almost like a threat. Because I, I heard some people are trying to go and protest in Abuja. And he says, okay, if you have no business in Abuja on the 29th of May, they don't want to see your, your they don't even smell your breath there i want to understand what is going on is there a planned protest or whatever that is happening but we'll take that after the break stay with us all right thanks for staying with us now if you just tuned in we're discussing the tribunal slash the labor party crisis even though david says it's not a crisis and its impact on the inauguration um that is going to happen on the 29th of uh, may and we have with us david Huday. now please let's hear what you have to say. remember you can join the conversation send us an sms or whatsapp to the red one eight zero three four six six three we see that we have a lot of viewers on youtube you can also leave your message there we'll take your messages so david before i went on a break i just mentioned because two things i saw uh, a communique, like a WhatsApp message that was forwarded, you know, from a very reliable source talking about a protest in Abuja. And of course, again, I saw the, I'm trying to get, I think it's the military chief, um, head of, uh, chief of staff or something, um, that said something around, do not come into Abuja if you have no business in Abuja and all of that. It almost like threatening people that if you come there, you know, whatever you see, you take it like that. Do you know anything about that? And is there any um, planned protests coming up? So the person you're referring to who put out that statement is actually Bashir Ahmad, okay. who is a, who happens to be a presidential spokesperson. Um, and what I'll say to that is, look, anybody can put out any statement saying anything. But at the end of the day, um, Nigeria is ruled by a constitution, not by individuals. So regardless of what anyone's opinion or what anyone's expressed position is on anything, what is important is what does the constitution say? Now, whether people... Um, are planning to have a protest on on the 29th of may or not is completely beside the point because the 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 real point of the matter is constitutionally you literally cannot forbid people from coming out mm. to do anything it is an it is stated very clearly in the constitution that one of 
the fundamental, um, the, the constitutionally guaranteed rights that are available to Nigerian citizens, freedom of movement, freedom of association. So the, the, if people decide, you know, as far as I know, um, there hasn't been any sort of concrete plan to do any such thing yet. But if people were to so decide of their own volition to come out en masse and carry out some sort of protest action on the 29th of May, well, the Nigerian constitution um, guarantees the right to do so. So I don't think uh, what Bashir Ahmad has to say um, outweighs what the Nigerian constitution has to say. So I, I, I think at this point, um, it's important to start facing some of these people down because I think they've got away with such things for eight years. Like, mm -hmm. you know that thing that we used to call um, government by decree during mm -hmm. the military era? Mm -hmm. And somebody just wakes up and just issues a statement and that statement just sort of becomes a de facto law, you know, by, you know, by government fiat. That's not how a democracy works. We're not, we're not under military dictatorship here. We're supposedly ruled by democratic constitution, we're supposedly an electoral democracy. There are, there are institutions, there's separation of powers, there are, there are levels and tiers of governance. So if even if for maybe for some security reasons or something, you know, um, it, it wasn't going to be desirable for there to be some mass gathering or whatever, it's not Bashir Ahmad who is going to come out and tell anybody that. It's not his job, it's not his place. He doesn't have the power to say such a thing. Okay. Ladies. <laughs> mm -hmm. Wow. wow. <laughs> David, some of the things that you're saying, I mean, it, it, it's it's quite interesting, but it's yet to be seen in the reality of the Nigeria that we live in today, where, you know, there are people who have come to protest that we, I mean, we're still coming uh, uh, to terms with the 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 happenings during the NSARS and things like that. So we're yet to see that Nigeria where we actually see the constitution come through for the Nigerian citizens. We're yet to see decisions uh, made in that regard. So um, my question would be, uh, would it, it, this crisis of confidence, is there any possibility that we can see it turn around in favor as in there to be a peaceful outcome from all of this and how can that happen well so as as far as anybody knows right now the what is happening is a judicial process it's a it's a constitutionally um prescribed process for for um for hearing grievances so Nobody is in the streets of Abuja firing guns. Um, there's no Sudan situation. There's nobody saying we're well, swearing in a parallel government. You know, in 2015 in Kenya, there was a similar situation and it was very different to this, the way it was handled. The then opposition candidate, Ray Laudinga, got some judge from somewhere, took his supporters to some stadium somewhere, and then got the judge to swear him in as something called the people's president and it caused the constitutional crisis there so if, if that's what was happening then yeah I, then i will get why people will be worried about maybe there being you know the threat to peace or whatever but so far that that has not been the case um, both opposition candidates have simply followed the prescribed process laid out under nigerian law so um i guess the what is happening is that the ruling party which um happens to not really have any case worth defending in court you know i mean if you if you have even if you're taking even a cursory look at the cases it will be very clear that the only play that the ruling party has is to try and drag this out and force the um the swearing in to take place and they try and use presidential power to scatter the whole thing because if it's heard in a court of law under normal circumstances even a nigerian judge cannot you know issue a favorable verdict to them that's the extent to which they simply do not have a case so what they are there, what they are doing in the interim is then feeding the narrative that somehow the opposition candidates and the opposition parties are doing something they are heating up the polity which is the, the favorite cliche of theirs that somehow something is being done to threaten nigeria's peace or whatever there is no such thing happening there is absolutely no such thing happening. All that is happening is that people are in court, which is what they are supposed to do. If there was an election that was held and you believe that the result that was announced does not reflect 
what actually took place during the election. What Nigerian law, what the Electoral Amendment Act says is you go to the post-election tribunal, you go to court. That's what both candidates have done. So, you know, you would then have to ask the question, why on earth is the ruling party so terrified about what should be an open if I mean if you really if you actually won the election, you shouldn't be terrified of the court case. So what are they so scared of that they are now trying to feed everyone that narrative? That oh my god, something is happening, the sky is going to fall. No, the sky is not going to fall down. Everybody everything is going to be just fine. Right? And if the case is heard fairly and it so happens that the supposed president elect is removed by the courts because it turns out that he did not in fact win the election or wasn't even qualified to run for the election in the first place. The sky is not going to fall down. Nothing is going to happen. Hmm. So I think the statement that I saw was from the chief of defense um, staff, if I'm not mistaken. But Jella, let me come to you. Um, okay, so um, I was um, going to, well, more like an observation, not really a question, more like um, that... Um, it almost seems like um, this whole um, tribunal issue is um, between Labour Party and, of course, the um, APC, the, candid um, the candidates that won. That's a Suwajo Ahmed Tenobo. Of course, um, for Atiko and um, Obi, they have um, different, their petitions were based on different um, reasons. So, um, so if let's imagine that the court um, now sits and all that, Obi by right says that well he has the majority of the legal votes. You know, again, Atiko says that um, he has the the what's it called by right. You know, he's invoking the margin of lead principle to assert that um, he should be declared winner and all that. What 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 are your thoughts on that? What do you think is going to happen? Because, I mean, if it comes... I hear you when you say that, um, I mean, in the event that anything happens, it probably falls to the Senate president to be sworn in as president. But now let's imagine that, okay, Aswaja Ahmed you know, is taken out of the race and then it's left between OB and Atiko. What do you think is going to happen at the tribunals? So if you... If you read the the, the petitions, uh, if you read Peter Obi's uh, petition specifically, what is actually asked is basically for uh, for the elections to be held again, because essentially what what the petition what that petition is mm -hmm. saying is that the entire process by which the election was conducted itself was fundamentally flawed, ah. and that um, at least one of the candidates. Uh, running in the election should not have been on the ballot. So the election itself is invalid. So that's actually what that petition is looking out for. So probably Atiku using, as, as you said, um, his own strategy is a bit different. His own strategy is, since I'm in second place, I should, by right, assume you know, the mantle. If the person who supposedly came in first place is taken out. But the, both petitions are asking for, for, for two different things. Um, it's not really my place to, um, to make a judgment here about which petition I think has has more um is Marriage. valid yeah but um that's what both that, that's what both have presented and ultimately it's up to the courts to decide um which of them if any it's going to side with mm. interesting okay. so how will all of this pan out david if you were to give a, um like based on you know the truth is if you study nigeria there's a pattern right is is very likely that you can you can have various outcomes in terms of if you do this you do this you do that these are likely outcomes right um but i just want to quickly touch on what jella said you know is it possible for us to have a rerun when you know the person that is probably strongest in in like fighting this thing through the courts came third because that's the argument that everybody has i'm, I'm tired of hearing that argument you didn't even come close. You didn't come. You didn't come second. You came third, and you're the one making a lot of noise. But let's keep that aside. If you study the Nigerian pattern, right? How would you say this? All this will, will pan out. Would there still be an inauguration? How would it just play out? In you know, from what you have seen and the patterns that is you know currently happening. So that's that's a very difficult question to answer because <laughs> um, to an extent we're also in we're in, on, we're in uncharted territory to an extent. Um, they, and ultimately, it boils down to the fact that um, this is not the first time the Nigerian election has been contested or has been contentious, but this is the first time when there has been 
um, so much evidence in the public domain that even the 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 the, the thoughts of swearing in the person announced by INEC is raising people's hackles. It's genuinely if a bone of contention now that this person should not be sworn in. As far as I'm aware, that hasn't, certainly since 1999, in the Fourth Republic, that hasn't really happened before. Um, even though we've had severely flawed elections in the past, such as the 2003 elections, not that more recent rule. But as far as I'm aware, this is poss quite possibly the candidate for possibly the, the worst regarded Nigerian election of all time, at least uh, I mean the, in, 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 in the Fourth Republic, certainly. So, I think given these unprecedented circumstances, even the judiciary um, is in also in uncharted territory. So this is one of those very rare occasions where um, instead of using uh, precedent to sort of project what is going to happen this time around, it's very likely that um, there's going to be a genuinely new outcome that we that it's it, that is basically impossible to predict. I mean the very the very outcome of, of the election itself should tell you that we are in uncharted territory. It has never happened before in Nigeria's history that we went into an election and um, a candidate that was viewed by the entire political establishment as this, you know, irritant outsider that does that has no realistic chance, you know, consistently written off. That was told, you know, you'd be lucky to come forth. You know, Kwan Kwasu will score more votes than you. Blah blah blah. You know, you should be competing with Yele Shore, you know, all those backhanded insults and everything. You know, some people, some TV stations organize debates and wouldn't invite him because they said he's not a, <laughs> he's he's not not a candidate. A, you know, and all of that happened. And even on the official results, as contentious as they are, even on the official results announced by INEC, which INEC's own data, by the way, contradicts. Right, but even on those official results, it still shows that this person, from basically nowhere, according to the official results, was neck and neck with somebody that's running for president since before I was, since around the time I was born. Right, so that should tell you that we're pretty much in uncharted territory here. So, I think the the, the judges, the courts are, are are aware of this too. Certainly, the international community is aware of this as well. They are not necessarily inter, um, intervening directly they they are not actually doing anything but what they are doing is watching and they're watching very intently i know this because i've been in these rooms with them multiple times you know we have these conversations off the record i'm not i'm not really allowed to sort of state what is in these conversations but essentially they're just sort of waiting and watching because they themselves have never really seen the nigerian electorates and the nigerian electoral system behave in this manner in before. this manner so that's why so, it's a bit scary too because again um, with all the things that has that has happened, it's almost like we are still going, you know, neck and neck. We are going to put it and do it, whether you like it or not. And that's why I'm even a bit afraid because I don't want any reoccurrence of maybe whatever that happened with NSAS. You you rightly put it clear. It's uncharted waters. But now let's come back because again, even um, Dele Farutimi had said in an interview when I was watching, he said that. The judicial, the tribunal, right? They have the, it's almost like having the yam and the knife. They have the opportunity to make history in this country, to go to the, uh, and come out, you know, just making sure that if they follow the facts, they, I mean, they announce, uh, what's it called? A verdict that it is based on evidence and everything, which, you know, to, I mean, people are somewhat confident that that evidence will tilt towards uh, Peter Obi's favor, right? In terms of like numbers and all of that. Uh, but, but, hey, judiciary, do you think they have the, the willpower? And again, given that economically, a lot of our guys in the judicial system, right, it's not like they have, you know, somebody can say David is sitting down chilling in London and is, you know, is cooling off and all of that. He can say whatever he likes. But this is the reality. The, the, I've always said it that poverty has been weaponized. It will continue to become a weapon in the hands of uh, powerful politicians because again when they want you to do their bidding right they would just you know throw you a fish and say okay yes go and do what i want you to do so do you think that we should even have a little faith in the judicial system well i don't i don't know about having faith in them but i think they're they're certainly intelligent enough to understand self-interest for you to have made it that far um you need to be intelligent enough to understand what is your interest to do and i think it should be clear to them um if they are not aware 
that it, it absolutely is in their interest to stand on the right side of history this time around. Now, what the right side of history means, they are at liberty to interpret. But um, what, what would definitely not be in their interest would be for them to um, act in a way that will put them in the crosshairs. And when I say in the crosshairs, I'm not, I'm not even referring to um, public perception in Nigeria. I'm referring to even international um, action because I, I'm sure you saw, I think it was last week, or was it the week before? No, it was last week when mm. the, um, the US Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, just put out this brief nondescript statement stating that um, the US has imposed visa bans on certain, certain people, people yes. who interfered with the electoral process. It didn't say who, the statement didn't say who, but the timing mm. of that statement, which I thought was, was, was very important and a lot of people missed it. The timing of that statement was very instructive. Now bear in mind that um, it is the, it's the, it's the typical custom that whenever um, a, a, a candidate wins an election anywhere in the world, within a few days, maximum a week, the US president always issues a congratulatory statement. So there's usually a statement on the White House website stating, this is the call transcript between President Barack Obama, President Joe Biden, President Donald Trump, and so and so and so of so and so country following so and so election. Right. I, I, I did a thread about this on, on Twitter a few days back. So I used several examples. So Nigeria in 2011 and 2015, and the Philippines in 2022, Brazil in 2022, um, Fiji, you know, there are several examples like that. And in this case, the US president, this election held three months ago, right? It's been three months since presidential election held, February 25. It's been three months, and Joe Biden has not said a single word. Mm. That silence is unprecedented and it's very loud. It's very instructive. So in as much as the U.S. president has refused to offer um, political acknowledgement to the supposed president-elect, and then the Secretary, U.S. Secretary of State has, has all but come out to say that um, we, have, we are imposing, because we know who those visa bans were imposed on. They were not imposed on people working for the Labour Party or, for, or people working for Abubakar Atiku. We know who those visa bans went to. So... The timing is very instructive, it's very mm. key. So I believe that the judges, whether or not they are good people, whether or not they, 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 they uphold the ethics of their profession, whether or not they want to do the right thing, I believe They'll that they be should really, be yes. to read the, right, the writing on the wall, to understand what is in their interests and what is not in their interests. And Absolutely. I think I'll leave it at that. Okay, let's quickly take some comments. Um, Jola and Norma. Um, I have one here that says that... Um, um, Obi is not known in the north. He lost in the southwest, not east, and not central. How can you say he won the election? Then the second one is, um, for God's sake, you're better informed. Think this guy who is somewhere in London. Whatever that means. All right, I have this one anonymous who says... Obi lost are just pity people that may have the heart or may have a heart attack when the judgment is announced. And then another one that says, if you know them, I dare you to name them. I think this was referring to David's last comment. David, you want to go ahead? We have a minute or two. <laughs> so again, you, at risk of, of getting you taken off the air, I'm just not going to bother responding because, you know, what is the point of responding to such people? Okay. So if you had one thing to say to Nigerians, you know, as the inauguration draws close, what would that be? What would you be saying to them? And, um, you know, just what's, what your general thoughts are? Well, my general thoughts are there are um, legal processes that are afoot. Um, Specifically on the 26th of May, which I believe is this coming Friday, there is supposed to be a seminal Supreme Court judgment, which would um, nullify the very candidacy of the, the, the Buhari Shetima ticket. Um, as I was informed this afternoon by an insider in Tinubu's camp, uh, he's currently trying to put pressure on President Buhari to declare Friday a public holiday so that the court cannot sit, as ridiculous as that sounds. Right? So what I would say is... Um, Nigerians need to uh, use their voices to uh, insist on the primacy of, of their legal processes. Um, if Nigeria is ever going to become a better place, if Nigeria is ever going to grow, 
um, Nigerians need to insist on the primacy of rules and the primacy of institutions over individuals and their self-interests. And I will leave it at that. Hmm. David, though, you have, you have thrown one insight. So you have inside gist for us that uh, they want to declare Friday as public holiday. That's what is tiring for me because all of these things is almost like using positions of power, you know, to, you know, to, how do I call it? Would I call it delay justice or to just completely, exactly. yes, yeah, stop justice? I mean, that's why, well, I'll keep hope alive. I'll, I'll have faith in the system. But thank you so much, David. You always come through for us. We will, we will call you back. Or maybe that Friday we'll call you back because this matter we can't we can't I mean we can't we can't stop talking about it. But thank you so much for your time, David. Thank yes. you, ladies. Thank you, Norma, and thank you, Diola. Now, before we go, ensure you follow us across all our social media handles at Wayshow Africa. You can interact with us further, drop a comment, and more importantly, follow all our engagements on social media. Like and share and invite your families and friends to watch and follow the conversation. If you missed our quote for today, here it is again. We're turned to pieces by parties and animosity. For my part, I see no end to them. I'm just hoping we're able to rise above all of these challenges that we're facing as a country and let justice prevail and let the right thing be done and let's have better leaders and better governance you know, going forward. We'll see you guys tomorrow at 8 p.m. as we bring another great conversation to your screen. Ciao.